Often when traveling by plane, the person sitting next to me asks what I do for a living. I'm sure that's happened to many of you. When I briefly describe my job, the common response is, oh, my grandmother used to sew. I nod and smile, knowing that the notions and machines used by our grandmothers are considered antiques. I thought it might be interesting to make the comparison, looking back at the sewing and quilting machines, books, and notions used in the past. With the help of vintage books and sewing collectibles, you'll see how far we've come. Sewing then and now, that's what's coming up next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman is made possible by Baby Lock, a complete line of sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines and sergers. Baby Lock, for the love of sewing. Madeira, specializing in embroidery, quilting, and special effect threads, because creativity is never black and white. Koala Studios, fine sewing furniture custom built in America. Clover, makers of sewing, knitting, quilting, and embroidery products for over 25 years. Experience the Clover difference. And amazing designs and Class A needles. When doing research for this program, one of the first things I did was go into our guest room, unveil my grandmother's sewing machine that hasn't probably been used in 45 years. I did some oiling, changed the needle, and my goodness, it ran. And I was so pleased. Uh, my grandmother, Georgina Larson, would be pleased to know that her machine is now on television today. But I also went to a library of our books, vintage books that we've been collecting over the years to find sewing techniques that apply to various area, eras. And the first book that I'm going to reference, The American Dressmaker Step-by-Step -Step Guide by Lydia Coates, was published in 1917. And just paging through this book is so fascinating because the photographs here, it's a fitting of a muslin, and you can see the, the photographs are really quite impressive. And a lot of sewing steps and, and, and as well as decorating steps are included in this book. But what I'd like to share with you today is a technique done many decades ago on how to cover a cord, make a corded piping. And all the sewing books that I've referenced have very similar techniques. And they use two cords to cover a cord, one thick cord and one narrow cord. And I have the step-by-steps to show you the then sewing technique. If you'd like to cover a cord, let's say a thick cord like I have on the top of my board, you stitch a smaller cord to the bottom, double the size. A bias strip is cut by hand. We did cut this with a rotary cutter, couldn't help ourselves. And then you wrap around the shorter side and stitch with your straight stitch sewing machine. Of course, that's what everyone had, a treadle or a straight stitch sewing machine. Then you have the shorter cord covered and you invert, invert the shorter cord on top of the longer cord. And here you can see the magic of it all. And on this side, we've just have it completely covered and you'd clip off the shorter cord and you'd be ready to use this in whatever project you were sewing. We also found in books, Another reference if you're, we're not going to include a cording, and the New Encyclopedia of Modern Sewing. This was published in 1943 and has a dedication in the beginning to the war effort and how everyone needs to do their part by doing sewing and making do, which is really charming reading. And the reference here in this chapter, Off to a Flying Start, the name of the chapter is how to make a belt, how to turn a tube without cording. No matter what the size the instructions say, you make a strip of fabric, sew it in half, of course, and then place a pencil end in the opening. And I've kind of started this already, but then you use that pencil and work it and work it and work it. And here we go. You can see, just make sure you take out the pencil before it's too late. Well, it's pretty tight. Here we go. And that's how you turn a tube with the then technique. And now I'd like to show you the now. Fast forward several decades and sewing now, we still get the same result, but with greater speed and I think greater accuracy. 
notions usually make the difference. Straight stitching is still what's needed to stitch the bias tubes, but the Notion product that we're going to be working with turns tubes with a cylinder tube, and then inside the tubes, there are many sizes of tubes, there's a wire, and the wire has a little curly cue at the end, which allows me to catch the fabric and pull it through the tube. I'll show you what I mean. A few minutes ago, I just showed you how to turn a tube by using the end of a pencil and inverting the tube in that manner. Well, this time we're going to not use a pencil, but insert the cylinder. And with one end of the cylinder closed, I will now insert the curly Q end, the wire, through the opening and wind it through. And the pigtail turn is out, and then I simply just have to invert it. And you could go a long distance with this manner and twist the curly Q in the opposite direction and you've turned a small to large tube. There are many different sizes of tubes so you can just choose the tube to fit your strip width. Now if you want to insert cording, the other option that we had many 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 years ago or our grandmothers had was to make a double length of cord with the smaller cord stitched to the larger cord and then invert one on top of the other. We can just use one cord, the cord that's going to go inside the fabric tube. As before, we just insert the cylinder and then do the same with the little wire. Just get it going. We're not going to turn it totally inside out. Let me just get it to the very end, but I'm just going to start to get, pull it through maybe by oh, a fourth of an inch. The cording end has been wrapped with tape just so that it's a little tighter. You could use masking tape or transparent tape and then it's magic comes out and it's already stuffed. So whether you're using a piece of fabric just to turn it right side out, wide, narrow, or medium, you can use a tube. There are many other botkins perhaps that you could choose from. And then when working with the cording, remember to apply a little bit of tape at the end so that it neatly goes into the tube and presto, you have sewn it the now way. If you have an antique sewing machine at home, you may want to take some time to look at the accessory box. What's included in the cardboard box or sometimes metal box are very, very interesting feet. This is more of a contraption, in my opinion, than a foot, but this is how it attaches to the machine. It's called a tucker. There were several types of felling feet to make flat felled seams. <clears throat> This, I haven't really figured out what this does just yet, but it's interesting tooling and, and manufacturing of this particular foot. And then a foot that looks very comparable to one that I have in my current machine, the ruffler foot, really hasn't changed. To me, it still looks like a dinosaur, and it does just about the same thing. But what isn't the same is some cutting techniques that I'd like to share with you that were often included, a cutting guide, within the accessory box. The Institute of Modern Sewing was an extension service sewing guide. You can see it's a home sewing course. It was out of New Haven, Connecticut. And the copyright is 1926 on these series. And it, every so often, I would imagine, the homemakers would get a new lesson to go through and learn. Well, the one that caught my eye was the one on presser feet. And the presser foot that was included, or a presser guide that was included in most accessory boxes was a cutting guide. This cutting guide fit along a scissors so that the person could cut bias strips evenly, not with a rotary cutter, ruler, and mat, but just by cutting and eyeballing with this guide. I'll show you the now technique, which is just a little bit easier. Years ago, when people needed to cut bias strips for the binding of quilts or for making bias tape, they used that little gauge on their scissors. It's not new to us that we're working with rotary cutters, rulers, and mats, but a little history on this. Rotary cutters were invented prior to rotary mats, and quickly, quickly the mats were developed because I remember ruining cutting boards, not knowing how sharp this was and how to work with it. There are many manufacturers of cutting mats, cutting rulers, and the markings on the rulers are so important. For bias, we would work with the 45 degree line, or if you had other angles for quilt blocks, like the tumbler block, you'd use the 30 degree or the 60 degree mark, and simply align 
the 45 degree line with the edge of the fabric and you would need a much longer ruler than I'm working with now. You could also align markings on your cutting mat. Cutting mats didn't have markings initially, now the markings help a square fabric getting things lined up. Even additionally, we have some rulers that are just made for binding. Two and a half inches wide, which is a common binding width, and then one end of it is cut on the bias. So you don't have to worry too much about aligning it except getting at the edge of the salvage. And the width is the width, a long width, so you can just cut down the section and you can cut binding after binding and get true bias with your rotary cutter and ruler. Next, a quilting technique. I'm going to reference the book written in 1940 called The Sewing Book Number no. 4 by Ruth Wyeth Spears. It was self-published as it appears. And it's a nice little pamphlet giving projects. But most of the projects are just assumed. There are a lot of the illustrations tell the sizes to make and the stories that go with it, not necessarily instructions. And we're going to learn how to make this unique quilt pattern the quilt pattern with quarter scale triangles in the corners and the center and then the strips of fabric that are connecting the triangles together. Now when Ruth wrote this book, the instructions that you saw on the side have nothing to do with the pattern, how to make the pattern. Rather, they have, tell about how she found this pattern. She was traveling 40 miles from New York City in the hills of Westchester County. They came upon a yard sale. There was this antique quilt, a simple American quilt, she writes. She said, well, it's not so simple after all. She could not afford to buy it. She sketched it out and gave us the patterns. No instructions other than the pattern pieces. The pattern pieces are for them. And I admire the women who could create this into a pattern without any instructions because when I cut this out, I was in a hurry and I realized I didn't really pay that much attention. But what ended up is all the sides of the seams are on the bias. So when I would have put this together, it would have stretched. I'll show you now how this is done without cutting any quarter scale triangles. In my sewing book from the 1940s, to make the quarter scale triangles, the templates definitely did the trick. But without paying attention, as I mentioned, I cut the wrong ends on the bias and a lot of sewing to get everything to match exactly in the center. Well, today, now, we have some notions that can solve the problem, make it very streamlined. And you cut squares instead of triangles. C squares, one light, one dark, and you stack two on top of each other. Now just a hint, if you'd like a three inch finished square, finished square, you cut a four and a fourth. In other words, you make it a four a inch and a fourth larger than your finished size. And you'll see why. You're going to mark on both sides of the notion that helps us do the job. It's a half an inch wide and you align the end with the on point drawing, draw on both sides of this and then stitch following those lines, just as I've done in this sample. After stitching, then you can cut down the center and separate them and you have two half square triangles. You're halfway there. You would press these, press both of them so that the seam allowance goes to the dark half and then trim off the extra little rabbit ears. We have two squares yielded from this and we're going to stack these together meeting opposite ends. I have a light and a dark and I put one on top of the other. Just double check my work. You can see what's going to happen. Place the ruler that matches or aligns. You draw on either side and after stitching and cutting you end up with two quarter scale triangles all cut on the right grain. There hasn't been a basic sewing book written that doesn't include information on hemming. And that's what I'm going to share next with you. From the book, The Art of Dressmaking, published in 1927 from the Butterick Company, we have basic sewing techniques. I'd like to show you the illustrations. I just thought these were interesting to look at. Pencil thin flapper style garments that you can see they're about 10 heads tall rather than the traditional eight to nine heads tall. So they look long and lean. And the instructions are very basic. And when we get to the hemming area, 
then you'll notice that they've asked us to use a recipe card to notch out the area of the hem width. So you could make it for any hem you'd like. Every time you'd sew, you'd have to make a new one. I found in my grandmother's collection from the Domestic Sewing Machine Company a free hem gauge with various NART markings, a little advertising on the back for cabinets. Looks like grandma did a little notching at 7 8 for a specific hem size. Well, we no longer have to rely on cardboard or paper for our hemming gauges. Today, sewing has lots of conveniences, and there's certainly nothing wrong with using a recipe card and a notch to mark hems, but when you can mark various widths of hems, and you depress the button and you stop, let's say, at a two and a fourth inch, it doesn't move, stays in the place that you'd like it, and then you can easily mark the hems between the two markings in this instance of the green gauges and press, press along the lower edge. Mark along, of course, two and fourth inches and press. Pretty accurate. If you have a curved hem, you could use another convenient notion, the gauge that has a curved edge calibrated just about for the curves that, that's often on hemlines. Bring the raw edge to the two and a fourth inch mark, and then I'll reach around and get my iron and press along the curve. Slide it, move it along to the two and a fourth inches. Make sure the edge is aligned and press. This is the sewing now for marking hems. Two easy ways for accuracy. Knowing a little bit about sewing notions, I'm always drawn to look at the vintage books to see what type of products were used in, in this instance, 1943. The New Encyclopedia of Modern Sewing it was written by Sally Blodden and Sally Dickens, excuse me, and Francis Blodden. And when I opened the book, I was just taken by the cute illustrations, small people, big products. Here, a huge needle and uh, a little person, and they talk about using the correct size needle, which that's important is to today as it was then. And it reminded me of an antique needle holder that my good friend Gail Brown gave to me, the Columbian egg of souvenir, I would assume, from the Columbian Exposition. And here we have the side of the spoke has all the sizes of the needle, and there's a little mark so you'd know which side to put this toward and put the needle in the hole at the top and then put it away and what a nice, compact, nicely made product. Well, we still have excellent ways to store needles, maybe not wooden and today, but in this dome we can place the threaded needle, just keep it threaded, which is really quite nice, and then swirl this around until you find the, the slot and the, that's where the thread goes, and then just wind it up and the thread nicely twirls around the disc and then you can cover it. I also found interesting this book, there was two pages at the end, a spread, two spreads at the end, that listed all the notions that they recommended, from scissors and snaps, not too many notions, all the way to working with irons. One that caught my eye though was how to remove seams, ripping. Use a razor blade for ripping with a single blade or a double blade. Seems a little bit an overkill for me to remove seams. Today, obviously, we have more than razor blades to use and seam rippers come in all shapes and sizes. Luckily, they all have, most of them have covers, which I think is superb, and a very sharp blade for surging. And then this little clippers, which I think is working very well. When I like to remove seams, you can see I have on my lap some stitches. I just clip along, clip along, clip every now and then. And then from the right side, pull out the seam, pull out the stitches, and work from the back to the front, and then just remove the stitches. I'm sure you've done this before, but it sure beats using a razor blade. So working with notions now and then, we're still doing the same thing, but the tools I have much are greatly improved. If only quilts could talk, the stories they could tell, 
since they obviously can't tell us the history or the maker of the quilt, my Nancy's Corner guest is a quilt detective and historian and is here to share the fascinating story of Harriet Powers and the Bible quilt. I'd like you to welcome Kyra Hicks. And Kyra, you are really a detective, and I, I would like to put you on that PBS show on the history of detectives. detectives yes. <laughs> Well, Nancy, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, I had a joy in doing the research about Harriet Powers and her quilts. And Harriet lived in the late 1800s. Yes. She was um, a slave in the Athens, Georgia area. Mm -hmm. And what we know is that um, there was a woman by the name of Jenny Smith who saw one of her quilts on display at a local fair. And that began the, the beginning of this fabulous story about Harriet Powers and her Bible quilts. Well, tell the story of this Bible quilt because it, it, the quilt itself tells a story. It does. Um, the Bible quilt is made up of different blocks with different um, Bible stories mm -hmm. from it. For example, there's Adam and Eve. And, and the it, upper left-hand corner. And the upper left-hand corner. If you go below that, there is Cain and Abel, when mm -hmm. Cain kills Abel, and you can see that trail of red blood. And underneath that, there is um, Christ on the cross between the two thieves. And then a little bit over to the right, you'll see um, Judas after having betrayed Christ with this pieces of silver. 30 pieces. Yes. So the story of the quilt obviously was a way of telling Bible stories to children and to family. Right. right. But then the story behind the story quilt. Oh, it's fascinating. Um, that particular Bible quilt was on display at something called the Cotton Fair in Athens, Georgia. And Jenny Smith, who was an uh, art teacher, saw it and wanted to buy it. Mm -hmm. And she found Harriet Powers, she found the maker of the quilt, and she offered her $10, and Harriet Powers said no. But about four years later, Harriet Powers and her family were in desperate need of money, and so she approached Jenny Smith again to say, you were interested in the quilt, would you like to buy it again for mm -hmm. $10? And Jenny Smith said, I don't have $10 now, I'm also facing hard times, kind of like so many people today sure. are. And she said, but I have $5. Oh. And Harriet Powers talked to her husband, and he said, you know, we need the money. And so Harriet Powers sold her quilt for five dollars. That kind of gives me goosebumps. Does it? <laughs> five dollars, this beautiful quilt. Yeah. But then how this quilt got into the Smithsonian. Sure. Well, um, one of the beautiful things though that um, Jenny Smith did was she recorded the stories of what all those blocks meant mm -hmm. from Harriet Powers. And when Jenny Smith died in 1946, um, it wasn't mentioned in the will what to do with the quilt, not specifically. And so the executor of the estate then kept the quilt and then eventually donated it to the Smithsonian. For all to see. For all to see. Now you wrote this all down in the book, This I Accomplish. Yes. And explain the title because that's a oh. very, I get goosebumps when I think about that. Sure. And that was part of the fabulous uncoverings, the detective part for mm -hmm. me. One of the things at the Smithsonian, when I was writing the bibliography for the book and trying to um, look at references mm -hmm. to Harriet Powers and other, other researchers' work, I noticed that people weren't necessarily citing sources. They were just saying things. Oh, sure. And assuming. So the, assuming things, and, and, or maybe they had the facts, but they didn't reference them. Mm -hmm. And so I took it upon myself to try to find where did that information come from? And one of the things I found at the Smithsonian was a photograph. One of the researchers there showed me a photograph taken at the Atlantic Cotton Fair of 1895. I'd never seen that. And on the back of it, a woman wrote that she wanted to buy the quilt, and it wasn't for sale. And so I was doing research on who is this woman. Mm -hmm. And what I found was she was a woman from Keokuk, Iowa. And I had never seen that in the literature. And so it, it, um, I tried to find as much as I could about this woman. Her name was Lorraine Diver, and I went to the Library of Congress. That's oh one of my. the advantages of living near D.C. Uh -huh. um, found out about her. I wrote to the Historical Society in Keokuk, Iowa, and um, there's even a gentleman that was on eBay oh. selling Keokuk postcards that I wrote to to say, do you know who this woman is? And eventually I found in Keokuk, Iowa, they had um, a photograph of Miss Diver, which was what I was looking for, along with more information about her. And then the vice president of the Historical Society sent me an email and said, Kyra, we have a folder with this photograph of Mrs. Diver that you're looking for, and also some letters that talk about quilts and a couple of pictures. Would you be interested? Oh. 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this I accomplished came from that. Yes. In that packet, in that folder, and the folks at the Historical Society had really had no idea what they had, mm -hmm. was a copy of a letter from Harriet Powers to Lorraine Divers. And she, and said, she signed it. This, this I, I accomplished. Accomplish. Kyra, what a joy to be with you and to hear this great story. And thank you for joining us, and as well as you joining us on Sewing with Nancy. Go to sewingwithnancy.com at the Nancy's Corner. You can click on the 2400 series and find information about Kyra. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now. Nancy has written a fully illustrated book entitled Nancy's Favorite 101 Notions that serves as the reference for this two-part series. It's $15.99 plus shipping and handling. To order the book, call 800-336-8373 or visit our website at sewingwithnancy.com slash 2425. Order item number Z3765, Nancy's Favorite 101 Notions, credit card orders only. To pay by check or money order, call the number on the screen for details. Visit Nancy's website at SewingWithNancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy, TV's longest airing sewing and quilting program with Nancy Zeman has been brought to you by Baby Lock, Madeira Threads, Koala Studios, Clover, Amazing Designs, and Class A Needles. Closed captioning funding provided by Rowenta. with Nancy is a co-production of Nancy Zeman Productions and Wisconsin Public Television.